Today we're going to be talking about Pentecostals, so strap on. I mean in. Strap in. Jesus, where did that come from? Okay, let's get into it. I have an interesting story for you guys. When I was a Jehovah's Witness, I knocked on one fellow's door who claimed to be apostolic. I was like, what the f*** is apostolic? Never heard of it. And religion is basically my whole life, so I was pretty surprised. I was around 13, probably. I figured he was a religious veteran, so I'd start out on the expert level. I said to him, you know the name Jehovah is in your Bible at Psalms 83:18, right? And he agreed, but then he continued to tell me that he handles snakes and whatnot. I was kind of blown away by it, and ultimately the brother who came to the door with me decided that it was out of our depth, so we ended up leaving. I went home and did a little research on them. Well, it turns out Pentecostals go by Apostolic Pentecostals. The root word for apostolic is apostle. They believe that the early church was formed by the apostles, and they want to get back to that. And the Pentecostal bit comes from Pentecost, which was the celebration that took place 50 days after Jesus died, or something like that. As it turns out, there are about 279 million classical Pentecostals in the world, according to a Pew Forum study. That accounts for 4% of the population of the world and 12.8% of the Christian population of the world. When you hear presidential candidates or campaigns talking about evangelicals, this is in large part who they're talking about. For the most part, there's no non-extremist Pentecostal. But you will find non-extremist Christians, people who accept evolution and for the most part live a chill life, doing to others as they'd want done to them, not hating gay people not heavily indoctrinating their children. They just believe in God and help their fellow citizen. But Pentecostals are all really serious about religion, i.e. the exact opposite of that. Their core beliefs and strange rituals all come from the book of Acts chapter 2. Let's talk about their beliefs and culture first. They believe that God's name was Jehovah in the Old Testament, and it was Jesus in the New Testament. They have some strange ideas about why they believe that, but I've actually talked about this before in some of my older videos, so check those out. There should be a card or something in the corner of the video here if you want to switch over to that for a minute. The women don't cut their hair, ever, and they only ever wear dresses. They believe that you have to be born again in the blood of the Lamb or some nonsense. I don't know why anybody would want to take a bath in the blood of a baby sheep. How messed up is that? Murder an innocent sheep for no goddamn reason. I imagine the process is messy. So anyways, if you come across a born-again Christian, they're probably Pentecostal. There are a lot of denominations of Pentecostal, so they might not call themselves that, but they're all from the same parent branch. They believe in divine healing. Basically, they think God can literally cure cancer and polio and whatever other ailment afflicts you. You'll find that kind of thing common among charlatan televangelists and megachurch pastors a lot. In fact, they're commonly some form of Pentecostal. They think that because there are healings in the Bible, why wouldn't they there be today. Fair point. So if we did a study proving that people weren't healed at a rate higher than chance remission, would that sway their faith? Anyways, they also believe in prophecy. They think the gift of prophecy operates within the church today. They think any Christian who's devoted enough and filled to the brim with Holy Spirit can prophesy things, but they can never use it for personal gain, and they think prophecy is fallible, i.e., the person prophesying can misunderstand what God's telling them. So the church basically examines the prophecy to see if it's actually from God. So the valuable ideas are attributed to God, and the stupid ones are attributed to the person misunderstanding what God was trying to tell him. Convenient. Now, as far as their rituals go, if you walk into a Pentecostal church service, you have a high chance of seeing a bunch of people running around and yelling out like f***ing fools. But they believe in falling out in the spirit, speaking in tongues, sometimes snake handling, and a bunch of other things. A lot of this comes from Mark 16, 17, and 18, which is hilarious because if you look in the margin notes of almost any study Bible, you'll see that it says, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. Based Basically, all Bible scholars at this point accept that the ending to Mark was added centuries later. The actual ending to Mark is talking about the women finding Jesus having walked out of his tomb, and it says, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. 
That's where the earliest manuscripts end. Then, hundreds of years later, we start to see verses 9 to 20 appear. It kind of continues the story about Jesus appearing to various people and giving them instructions. But the important part is verse 17 and verse 18, which say, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. So that's the whole basis for their system of rituals. They handle snakes and drink poison. A lot of Pentecostal preachers have died from drinking too much poison. They try to build up an immunity by poisoning themselves with a low dose and increasing it every day until they have a tolerance for it. All for a set of verses that was added in by monks centuries later. In their defense, snake handling and drinking poison is on the extreme end of the spectrum. Not all Pentecostals do that, but faith healing is really popular among Pentecostals, as is falling out in the spirit and speaking in tongues. Apparently, falling out in the spirit is also called being slain in the spirit. I'd never heard it called that before I made this video, but it's the same thing. Anyways, it's described as the power of the Holy Spirit so filling a person with a heightened inner awareness that the body's energy fades away and the person collapses to the floor. I'm pretty sure Dusty Smith from Cult of Dusty was Pentecostal and he said the people in the back row always knew not to fall out in the spirit because there was nobody there to catch you. I feel like I remembered him saying one time a woman fell out in the spirit and expected the person behind her to catch her but they didn't. She just fell flat on the floor. I guess I can see how people become so energized and worked up from the environment and adrenaline and music all going on around them, it might make them legitimately pass out, but I suspect most of it's fake. Apparently the ritual goes like this. People might go to the front of the church where the ministers pray over them. Sometimes the ministers will do what's called the laying on of hands, where they place their hands on you to force the Holy Spirit into you, and they'll pour anointing oil on you. Wow, that sucks. Can you imagine getting olive oil poured on your head at church? Jesus. Who would want that? Anyways, after the ceremony or whatever it is ends, the person will fall and usually they fall backwards where they're caught by ushers. Then they'll lay on the floor with their eyes closed and their face up for anywhere from a few seconds to a few hours sometimes. He could not speak correctly! What's he doing? He's assaulting those people. He's supposed to lay his hands on their head. He's just pushing them over. It looked like that woman didn't even expect it. This is hilarious. What an awesome job. You push people down for a living. Run, lady. Didn't you see what he did to that kid with the stutter? He's winding up. In all seriousness, this is an extremely harmful practice. That woman he just pushed on her ass has cancer. Instead of going to this f***ing charlatan, she could be in a hospital getting real medical treatment that may legitimately extend her life. Besides, this guy's just a showman. Here's what it looks like in a real church. This place. Step into the waters. Well, semi-real. Okay, they're all charlatans. I'm sure you can understand why people would stick to this until the day they die. When you have that kind of experience, that level of surety, it's not easy to break. In fact, I'm impressed that people break it at all. But like I mentioned earlier, Dusty Smith broke free of it. His newer videos haven't been top-notch, but he has a library of older stuff that's so worth the watch. Free shout-out, Dusty. Anyways, there was one more thing I wanted to talk about. Speaking in tongues. That originates from the Bible verse talking about how the Holy Spirit filled the room and people started talking in different languages. So the ritual goes like this. Somebody stands up and starts speaking incoherently, and somebody else will stand and, quote-unquote, translate for them. They'll start saying what they think God is trying to communicate through the person. I don't know why God couldn't just say it himself. He's all powerful. Anyways, this is what it looks like. Bound by crack, bound by alcohol. Oh, la bacanda da 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 da
Do you want to be free from that sexual perversion? Isn't that something called a moshoko doma zata? Mata toto moto ndoichi ki shikada kapoko to koto kalaka moshiti. Kali shikado boko to la baka tai shakabo chokole kamoko teya. I love you. Some preachers like Dan Barker were once evangelical like this in spoken tongues, and they turned atheist, but can still do it on command. It's a learned skill. Okay, that's all I have for you guys. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Patreon. Thanks for watching.